giorni qua non ci deve essere più niente, bisogna cominciare subito. Coraggio, al lavoro, buttate giù. Dico bene, autore? Sì, grazie. Arrivederci, ragazzi. Ci vediamo in un prossimo video. Lo speriamo. Welcome to Cinema Italia, a podcast dedicated to the world of Italian cinema. Presented by me, John Bleasdale. Everybody and welcome to Cinema Italia. My name is John Bleasdale. I'm a writer and film critic. And today I'm delighted to have Adrian Wooten with me, the programmer of the BFI season on the Taviani brothers, uh, before the Cohen brothers, before everybody else, uh, the Wachowski siblings. There were the Taviani brothers who were who were making a series of Italian films, which um, in some ways to me feel somewhat neglected um would you would you agree with that adrian i I would entirely agree with with that i think that um that for me was the main wellspring of wanting to do this first comprehensive season in the uk and the very fact i'm saying that the first comprehensive season in the uk tells its own story um there there have been other retrospectives i'm aware of around the world but but actually even the the last one I, i know of english language one was in new york and that was 10 or 12 years ago, and that wasn't comprehensive either. So um, I think that whilst they're incredibly well known in Italy and they and obviously they've had success at major festivals over the years and won the Palme d'Or in Cannes and the Golden Lion in in Venice, they still have never had the same, let's say, the, the, the same kind of consciousness public awareness that some of their contemporaries you know um whether it be Sergio Leone or Pasolini or you know people of of more or less the same era um and and they they haven't had that same international awareness I don't think and they really span uh, uh you know decades and decades of Italian uh cinema uh, you know right up until very recently you know with uh, Cesare deve morire the Caesar must die and i remember when that was sort of reported it people were sort of saying even in the italian press oh it's an overnight success for these guys who have actually been around for donkey's years no you're absolutely right i mean Caesar must die definitely um that that, that that worldwide success in 2012 kind of brought them back actually in a way to mm. international awareness um, after years when people really, even though they were making movies, some for television, for Rai in the noughties and and then back into cinema, um, there wasn't an awareness about them. And yet you're, you're right. I mean, they, they, they started making films in 1962, you know, um, uh, you know, the first, their first feature, um, co-directed with Valentino Orsini, um, the, this man for burning was 1962, and so they they have had nearly 60 years. Uh, you know, obviously uh, the last film that made together before Vittorio died, um, Rainbow Private Affair in 2018. Um, and, but yeah, they they worked together for nearly 60 years, and then of course we've had you know one possibly last film from uh, Paolo uh, himself in 22. But um, but no, it's an extraordinary legacy of, of, of cinema. And I personally believe that their cinema is unique and as distinctive as any other uh, filmmaker of, of their era. Uh, and, and I was very keen, and this season has been in the planning in the UK for five, six years, mm. um, I was very keen to create, to, to, to create that opportunity. And, and it's, it's funny, I gave a talk on the first night, the weekend before last, uh, a, a, a talk about the whole career. And whilst there were one or two people in the audience and going to see a film afterwards who knew them and seen quite a lot, the vast majority of the audience um, had seen little or nothing. And people were coming up to me, including staff in the British Film Institute, saying, I've never seen any of the films, or I've only ever seen this one. And it just went to prove my point. you know. And, and even a friend of mine who used to work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York 
he I gave him a copy of the the catalogue that we produced that Chinichita produced, um, which I've got written a very long essay in, um, and that he he actually wrote back to me and said I like this very much. He said and it's amazing to me. He said because there's a whole bunch of their films I've never seen mm. and that you've got, you know, and that just indicates the you know the, the that level of, of not obscurity but but unknowingness that people have and and certainly for me going back and either reviewing or looking for the first time particularly at some of their early work was quite a revelation to see the depth and breadth of their work um and you know the subjects they've tackled the authors they've adapted um, you know, the, the, the historical time periods that they've explored um, is it, incredibly rich. I was going to say, I, that's actually a word that I was thinking of when you were talking was breadth. And then you mentioned it, of course. And, uh, but but uh, the other thing is, well, I mean, it's difficult to really work out why they're not more celebrated because their films are incredibly accessible. They're credibly, yeah. there's nothing difficult. It's not like, no. I don't know, Pasolini where you might say, okay, this is going to be a hard watch. I mean, yeah. I love Pasolini. I'm not taking nothing away from Pasolini. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah. But um, there's nothing, that's, uh, there's no obstacle to you, to anybody enjoying them. No, it's not like, you know, whether it's Pasolini or they're not, you know, it's not like Antonioni either, where you're sitting there thinking this is a work of genius, but I don't understand a word. You know, it's <laughs> not, we're not having that, you know. Um, no, you're right. I think their films, I mean, that's why I call the, the you know, I, I, I talk about magical realism and, and the fables because they're fantastic storytellers. Mm. And the way in which they use both gritty kind of almost documentary and, and real life and real life instances and mix that with with playful fantasy and comedy and extraordinary cinematic you know twists of imagination is is amazing and 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 I that's exactly why I thought you know people need to be aware you know even if we introduce them to three or four films you know the three or four of the most famous but but actually the canon is is so packed with really really interesting work that I just I, I look at and think well. Why do more people not have more people not have the opportunity to see this? And if they do see it, they're going to actually find a whole cinematic journey of discovery that they're going to find really exciting because because these th these men are incredibly inventive, incredibly um, you know brilliant storytellers, brilliant cinema brilliant filmmakers, um, but also passionate, passionate about politics, passionate about history, passionate about society, passionate about novels, passionate about mm. cinema itself, the references that they, they make in their films to, to cinema um, and, and the filmmakers they love, like Rossellini, for example, um, you know, are very, very clear. So anybody that loves cinema, I, I believe, you know, this is, I wish I was discovering them again because the pleasure of, of that somebody will have actually diving into the world of the Tavianis, I think is a really, really rich pleasure and and, um, and will make them wanting more and more. Yeah, I mean, it's almost that thing I sometimes when you think of a, a BFI season, you sort of think, OK, there's a couple of these films you're going to have to grit your teeth and it, yeah. it's, it's going to be rewarding, but it's going to be rewarding in a way that you're going to have to work for. But in this case, that's that that's not not the case. Could you give us a sort of background, a historical background as to how the, you know, you say they began in uh, 1962, um, how they started working together, what's the sort of context of their rise? And um, Because they, from 62, they don't really break through for a few years as well they have no no, to... no no they don't i mean they they, they, they well that they, they started you know they came from tuscany born within a couple of years of each other um in the 1930s they um uh actually had quite traumatic experiences as children being evacuated from the, the, the little village they lived in in Tuscany, which formed the basis for the Night of the Shooting Stars. It's deeply autobiographical because it is about their town, San Minato, which which was bombed and, and, and there was a terrible uh, series of deaths in the town during the sort of fights between the partisans and the Nazis. Um, and... Um, they were evacuated, uh, lived in, in Pisa for a while. Then they actually went to university, sort of college and university in both Pisa and uh, Florence. 
their father was a, a sort of well-to-do lawyer and they they were originally well were they were going to do law no were they going to do they they, they 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 tinkered with the idea of being journalists and they always seem to be joined at the hip even though they were not twins and there's a couple of years between them um they were joined at the hip in everything they did and and from a very early age and just encouraged by their sort of liberal humanist father and mother they were in the arts. They were gripped by cinema, and that they talk about how they saw Rossellini um, in, in the aftermath of World War Two, Paisan and Germany Year Zero, and and they you know and they liked Visconti etc. But it was the it was the neo realism of, of of Rossellini that really gripped them to begin with, and they basically it was a famous quote where they basically said, "Well, we decided we were going to be filmmakers, or we we're going to die," and there was no other choice. And and there's a funny story because um, actually. Um, Paolo met his his wife, who was also their costume designer, Lena, the, who's designed all the costumes for all their films, met at school. And mm. she was a couple of years younger than him. And, and she was put at the same desk as him in the school and didn't realise it until she started looking at the desk. And then in the desk, the wooden desk, she found all these names of legendary filmmakers scratched into the desk, Visconti, John Ford, <laughs> da, da, da. and then somebody, and she said, who sat at this desk? And I said, oh, yeah, Paolo, Paolo sat at this desk. And all he did in the lessons was scratch the name of filmmakers whose work he and his brother were watching. Anyway, cut forwards. They, they met this other guy, Valentino Orsini, in a cinema, formed a bit of a partnership with him, and they caught a train to Rome, and they got the names of some producers and they put themselves in front of these producers and said, we, we want to go into films and we want to make a documentary about our hometown. And this rather benign senior producer who didn't take offence at them turning up at his house and he didn't know them at all, they gave, they, he gave them some money and they made this documentary and they were kind of on their way. And it was extraordinary that they then, they moved to Rome, um, they... they they moved to Rome. They started working. Um, they had no formal education in, in cinema. They didn't go to the Centro Sperimentale or anything like that. Mm. They just started working. And they got the trust of various peoples and producers. They, they started to form a little creative team of young people around them. Um, and they scraped the money together with Orsini to make This Man for Burning, which is based on a true story of a, a peasant union leader trying to... Re- create a revolt against the mafia. And that film got made on almost nothing, deeply indebted to Rossellini in 1962. And the film won all these awards in Venice. It, and and it, didn't, it didn't break out internationally. But suddenly there were persons of interest in Italy. Mm. It was like, oh, these guys we've never heard of, these brothers, they managed to make this low-budget feature film. They became the darlings of Venice in 1962. And all of a sudden people then said, oh, well, maybe we'll fund them maybe we'll give them some money and they were on their way and they they got this guy uh guy Giuliani Negri who became their producer was their producer actually till he died um and they started to scrape together money they made another film um called uh Outlaws of Love um and that um was about the Catholic Catholic well, lack of marriage laws divorce laws in in, mm. in Italy at the time which was quite a controversial and topical subject um and then they they made a film in in 67 which which i think started to define what they were really going to be as filmmakers called the subversives and the subversives is about politics and it's about contemporary politics and about italy but it's also about cinema it's got a whole sequence with them watching john luc goddard it's piero le fou in the cinema and and, and then feeling that kind of revolutionary 60s movement and and them trying to engage with that in terms of Italy. And and they were very much then in the zeitgeist, the vanguard, along with, you know, people like Bellocchio and, and, and other, you know, and, and another contemporary there's very obvious contemporary, Bertolucci mm. and, that, and, and Leone. And they were part of that. They were, they were in the mix and they were regarded as relevant contemporary filmmakers. Their movies weren't making any money, really, but they were being critically received and they were being shown at a few festivals. Um, but it isn't, it, you're right, it isn't really until we get, you know, they made their first movie in colour, which is a very bizarre kind of prehistoric movie under the sign of Scorpio. But it isn't until we get into the 70s. And, in, and suddenly in the 70s, they kind of, they've been experimenting, they've been making films about politics and contemporary Italian life. And suddenly they find their feet and they find their feet 
really, I think, with kind of period drama. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they make they make a film called St. Michael at a Rooster, which Nanny Moretti loves. Um, and it suddenly wedded their interest in politics and history uh, and literature. It's based on a whole story, short story, one of their great favourites, with a, 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 a kind of explosion of cinematic invention, the inventiveness. And all of a sudden you sort of think, ah, oh, they're starting to play. Mm. They're starting to explore the, the limits of their medium and thinking, well, we can manipulate time and space. We can do things. We can go from what seems like documentary to, oh, no, cinematic fantasy and invention in the space of a, cup, of, of a scene. And, and all of a sudden, you suddenly see them blossom as the seven. They get a bit more money. They, get a, they make another film with, they make their first film with a, a star in, uh, you know, Marcello Mastriani with uh, Alain Fancin. Um, and they get a bigger budget in 74, um, and people start to notice them. And then, then they pick up a book, a contemporary book, but a book that was actually set in the 40s. True life story about a, a peasant boy abused by his father in, in servitude in Sardinia who makes a break for personal independence and freedom and education and life. And they love the book. Rye basically originally wanted to make as a TV movie. They made it on, again, very little. They made it, and everyone looked at it and went, oh, my God, this is sensational. This, this, this isn't a TV movie. And suddenly Cannes said, we want it in competition. Mm. And Cannes took it in competition in 77. Rossellini is the chair of the jury. You know? <laughs> and they're, they're mentor. And it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale because the movie Padre Padroni, Father Master, is a masterpiece, their first real masterpiece, although the other two films before have been great. And suddenly they're on their way. They, they mm. win the Palme d'Or and Italy wants to fund everything they want to do. And, they, and they've, they're and they given the licence. Suddenly they've got a team around them. It's the same editor. It's the same cinematography. It's largely the same composer. It's the costume design. They build this team and they create their own mini factory, their own mini family, if you like, extended family, and 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 things sort of just, you know, go up and up from there. Really, I, I mean, it's uh, it's so interesting you talk about that family as well because that that such feels like such an Italian part of the Italian film industry. There's a you know the Ennio Morricone story of going to school with Sergio Leone, and even yeah. even though they yeah. didn't remember it, and it's just no. got that you know everybody's in that small neighbourhood somewhere. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely right. I mean, the you know, the the their editor, uh, Roberto Perpignan, who's still their editor now, did Leonardo Adio for for um, uh, Paolo in twenty one twenty two. His when their producer got ill and died, Negri, it, it his assistant producer is actually the wife of the editor. Mm. You know, and then you have a particular composer they worked with forever, Nicola Piviani. He it mentors Vittorio's son, and then when he stops being the composer, Vittorio's son takes over the composition of their films. So it it really is a family affair. It's like a and it's an extended family, but they but it's such a and, and I think that's what gave them strength, to be honest, that they could make brave decisions, they could plow their own furrow, not not being told make this or what about this or what about that. Saying no, we're looking at this. We're looking at that, and, and existed in a kind of a creative bubble, if you like, which allowed them the, the freedom and with their collaborators to come up with really anything they wanted. And, and it seems to be that Paolo and Vittorio almost communicate telepathically. You know, it's like ESP between them. Um, they alternatively direct scenes. They one works with the actors, one behind the camera, and vice versa, and they do that with shot by shot, scene by scene. They um, they met each other every day of their lives. And when, even when they weren't shooting, they were arguing about what they were going to make next and exchanging books, newspaper articles. They met every day for coffee and would argue and talk about what they might do next. So it was, it was their whole lives for cinema. I mean, nothing nothing else in, in to, <laughs> intruded. Yeah, they've got wives, they've got families, they've got kids, but everyone was brought into the enterprise. And I think that's what makes their work have a a singularity and a purity because you really are seeing the artistic vision, this joint artistic vision, which is stronger, frankly, that, you know, it's like, I mean, Paolo and Pressburger were 
brothers. Um, and there was a clear distinction between Powell writing and, and Pressburger, sorry, Pressburger writing and Powell directing. Even I don't think Ethan and, and Joel, which is the closest equivalent, I think, you know, mm. the Coens, I still think the symbiosis between the Tavianis is 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 really unique in cinema. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder if it's too neat to say that there's something in that methodology of how they're making films and also one of the major themes that runs through the films, which is, uh, to me, about endangered communities and commu how communities can be resilient and how they can come together. Um, I mean, obviously, the... the um, uh, I'm thinking of La Notte de San Lorenzo, which is yeah, the night yeah, of falling yeah. stars, night of shooting yeah. stars. Um, you know, how a community goes through the worst of a civil war and yet still remains somehow a community. Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely right. John. I think that, you know, war and conflict and and the pressures on that, you, you're, you're, you're right. Um, there's there's politics, but yes, it, it, you know, in This Man for Burning, the union leader, the very first film that, the union leader is trying to rally the peasant community to throw off the yoke of the mafia in rural Sicily, you know, mm. um, in, in um, even in, under the sign of Scorpio, they're pretty silent. It's about one community trying to survive by taking over another community. It's a threatened community in, in the night of shooting stars. It, the Lark Farm is the, the, the Armenian, the Turkish Armenian community facing genocide and, and trying to tr trying to survive in impossible um circumstances uh, it's a different kind of community in caesar must die but it's a community of criminals inside a security prison and about them having a cathartic experience acting shakespeare whilst living their lives inside a jail because they're all convicted murderers you know um so so you're you're absolutely right there's um it's definitely a a, a thread through uh, a thread through their work, and and it's also very interesting to me that it's I th I think of them as of like poets and and cinema makers of the external world that you know the characters fit into the landscapes, particularly of Tuscany, because where the brothers come from, but Tuscany and Sicily and Sardinia and Umbria, um, you have lots of interiors, of course you do in, in the Tabiani Brothers, but if you think about some of their most famous sequences, they happen in the hills and the valleys and the fields. Um, the, the, the characters are outside in nature, and nature and the landscape is absolutely, whether it's in Chaos or Night of the Shooting Stars, um, or, you know, in the, even in a, a film, you know, adapted from Goethe, you know, Elective Affinities, which they transport transport from germany again back into tuscany um so so there is something about communities the the threat the resilience families community but it's also in the context of a rural landscape that has its own magic and mystery that they interact with yeah, I mean, that reminds me of like something like Bertolucci's 1900 is a little bit more. He sees the the terror, but he sees it from a from like a painterly perspective, whereas yes. they see it more as a lived in, worked in, died in. You know, some people are in the long grass and it might be an ambush or it might be, a you know, a massacre. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And, and and they don't shy away from the. The terrible consequences of of violence and, and and war and conflict and what politics can and can't do, and and actually that's one of the other things that I think is really interesting because because war you know the Napoleonic Wars is featured in a number of their uh, films like uh, Fiorelli, um, it, it features in Elective Affinities, um, it, it features in Alain Fanson, and they the way they depict conflict. It, it's very interesting. It, it's almost like dance. They, they they love music, and there's lots of dance, lots of famous dance sequences in their films. There's one in on Zion Scorpio. There's one in Cast. But war is like a dance, but it's like a tragic, comic, absurd dance. When you see fight sequences or battle sequences or action sequences, they are highly orchestrated, but they're also ridiculous. They're mm. ridiculous because they do not want in any way. To either sentimentalise or make heroic the act of violence, instead they they make it abstract in terms of a, a sort of crazy dance, and then they make it tragic and grotesque. Um, and I think it's another one of their incredible gifts as filmmakers, the way they they orchestrate things. There's such a, to to reuse a word. Um, 
breadth of empathy as well that you know you do see people commit evil and you do see people commit horrific acts but then you're still asked in some degree to empathize with their suffering as well i'm thinking of the sort of fascist and his son in the night of the shooting stars who yes. you know are absolutely contemptible and then at the end you absolutely feel for the father who's just seen his son executed and it's just like yeah. oh my god i wish they hadn't they're all trapped in this tragic cycle of violence I, you're absolutely right it's one of the things that they they really do create three-dimensional characters they, they're not interested in stereotypes they're right. not interested in ciphers they're not as interested in genre types in that sense they always want to give you that additional bit of perspective that forces you to have a more complex interaction with the characters and i think you know i've, I've seen and heard um a number of actors from from the most famous isabel who bears of this world um through to some of the you know the, the the actors that appear again and again in their films talk about their work and the way that they they were really demanding of their actors very mm. tactile very demonstrative and you can see in some, some behind the scenes footage that there is of them about the way in which they are kind of acting out the scenes with the actors and and actually the, the actors all say and they forced us to go beyond and beyond and beyond in the takes and and be, but because they loved them they did it because th th their passion and enthusiasm and they talk about how you know um that that you know it's like good cop bad cop paolo is the more sort of cerebral it's like good cop and vittorio is the kind of passionate demonstrative sort of bad cop um and the way they kind of balance that out in terms of them drawing the performance out but i think you see it shows you see that that depth um show in um in, in all of their films really that, that that you look in even in relatively small parts you think they've really honed that to a point where um it's not simplistic it is it is and it forces you to have more complex ambivalent thoughts about what's actually going on Absolutely. It's human. It's humanity. And it's yeah. it's sort of people, you know, people behaving. I mean, I noticed that with the acting as well, that there's this sort of bigness to it. And and, and people do live in big ways. They don't live with small gestures or ticks. They don't whisper into ADR microphones. They shout and scream and all the rest of it. No, that and, and emotion is, is very much a part of their films. They, yeah, Of course, they're cerebral intellectual filmmakers, but but emotional, you use the word empathy, emotional empathy, emotional intensity is a hallmark uh, of their work. And, and you know, if you look at a film like Lark Farm quite late in their career, you know, 2007, which is all of, you know, based on a, um, an, an Italian uh, Armenian novelist, um, uh, his work, you know, looking at that, that First World War genocide, um, which got them into a lot of hot water with the Turkish authorities because the Turkish authorities always denied it was a genocide. And the way in which they characterise the, the, the terrible suffering, pain and tragic violent deaths that the characters experience, whilst at the same time also showing this impossible romance between a Turkish soldier and an Armenian woman, um, again, it, it has that layered complexity sensitivity that it's not just didactic it's not just bashing you over the head and saying oh these are all bad guys that's a fascist that's a nazi that's a that's a bad turkish guy you know um these people are repugnant there's no two ways about it but what they're doing is is giving you their version of a of of, of veracity of, of authenticity uh, and i think they do it brilliantly so we've got the the season is ongoing at the moment. This yep. uh, podcast will come out on Friday, so people in London will hopefully have a chance to to see some of these films uh, before they stop. But even people who are not in London for this and are uh, interested in our conversation, where where what's the entry drug for the Taviani brothers? What's the where would you point them to begin? I I, I would point them. I mean, you know. Some people would say the entry drug is is Caesar Must Die because it, it was the most recent and most acclaimed of their films, and, mm. and what it does with Shakespeare is one of the best uses of Shakespeare in a movie I've ever seen. You know, it's, it's, it's up there with Kurosawa and you know the Throne of Blood uh, in terms of the way in which they use Shakespeare, and in this instance, Julius Caesar, obviously. Um, um, so I think you know that as a as a 
you know, most most modern point of entry is, is a good place to start. But I think, you know, you can't get away from the fact that um, Night of the Shooting Stars is absolutely, you know, a, a, a masterpiece of cinema and is beautiful, tragic, cathartic, funny, all of that. The same is true of Padre Padrani, I think. I think that, uh, you know, re-watching that and, again, looking at the way they, you know, um, the, the way that, the, the, the so many, there's really hard scenes in that, and then suddenly you have, you know, the, the boy central character trying to milk a goat, and the goat talking to him in a kind of fantasy magic scene, and you think only they could do that, only they could do. It. So those are the three obvious titles I would say: a Season Must Die, Nice the Shooting Stars, and Padre Padre. Just you know, as a starting place, um, I would say in terms of sheer. Um, accessibility but i think chaos again you know with the way in which again one of their hallmarks using multiple narratives using multiple pirandello stories is so beautiful it's very, not very funny scenes it's even got a horror werewolf story in it it's, you know is is another great and really accessible film of those so so that quartet and if you don't if you don't like the Tavianis after that then <laughs> they're not for you. <laughs> yeah. There's no hope for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Abandon all hope, you who do not yeah. like the Tavianis after those. And I'm i and and nice Judy's eyes is on in in March as well. Um because I've divided the season into four chunks at the moment. We've got um politics of rebellion and, and literature running, and then next month it's um films grouped uh into um War and Conflict um, and the Inspiration of Cinema. And, and uh, I'm introducing the Nights of the Shooting Stars um, in uh, in March. I'm doing an extended introduction to it as well. So th there is opportunities to to see them. But those are those are the four I'd, I'd go with to begin. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's interesting that Night of the Shooting Stars is like 1982. And you also, you sort of think of the golden age of Italian cinema being kind of almost over by then and then you get this 1982 film i know there's we have cinema paradise or other films coming yeah. late, later and later but that's already feels like a nostalgia of you know didn't italian cinema used to be good good you know um, no and, and you're right the 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 80s and, and particularly then into the noughties were unkind and the, and the taviani's brothers i think even in italy became kind of unfashionable in the late 90s and early noughties which is why they did you know, two big television movies, um, mm. an adaptation of Tolstoy's Resurrection and um, and an adaptation of the Alexander Dumas novel, uh, Luis uh, San Felice. But, but um, you know, they were making interesting films right through that period. I mean, you know, the after Night of the Shooting Stars, they did The Wonderful Chaos. Um, there's also, um, again, another Pirandello ad uh, dual adaptation, the, 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 the film You Laugh, which I think is... Is, is great and I love the Goethe adaptation starring the French their one French co-production and it, and and I also like their movies about movies I mean you know Good Morning Babylon from 87 got mixed reply responses because it was their one sort of US international co-production but I, I love the idea of you know these two craftsmen Italian craftsmen going you know, to America to work in the silent era. Oh, that's a film with uh, yeah. Gre Greta Scacchi yeah. and it's yeah. Uh, yeah. Kabiria, yeah. isn't it? The, yeah, the... it is. Yeah. Good, good morning, Babylon. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, so so there's, you know, I think they carried on. I, I'm 100% convinced I wouldn't have put them in the, the, the season if I didn't, but Good Morning Babylon is also in, I think, in March as well. But, um, but you know, the, there's some really, you know, fantastic works that they... The, on the back of making Nice of the Shooting Stars, such a, a high water mark for them. But they then made a bunch of really great films afterwards, I think. And ambitious films, say, US co production with Good Morning Babylon, French co production with uh, Elective Affinities, which is such a beautiful, moving kind of chamber piece um, with, 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 you know, the divine Isabelle Herbert. There are, you know, there's definitely riches in them there, Hills to Mine, you know. Yeah, yeah. And look, you know, going on for so long as well, having such a long longevity and having um were there any moments where they did have like falling outs or disagreements in terms of politics or cinema or was there ever I don't a moment think where they ever fell out? I, uh -huh. I think I think you're right. That period of Italian cinema, you know, which sort of you know, there's a period like from the late eighties when, you know, filmmakers started to get old and 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 a new wave hadn't cut, kicked in, 
you know, mm. the new wave, you know, Moretti's there. And Moretti actually, you know, acted with the acted in. I think he's got a bit role in Padre Padre and is a huge fan of theirs. But Moretti was sort of coming along in the late 80s. Um, but you hadn't got, you know, you hadn't had the Sorrentino wave. And so mm. Italian mm. cinema was, was unfashionable. They were unfashionable in terms of Italian film funding. Rye gave them a, a lifeline. And they sort of they got back out there with a the Lark Farm and, and that made some noise. Um, but it is, as, as we started this with, it, it was when Season Must Die came out that everybody kind of went, oh, my God, yes, of course, the Taviani brothers. Yeah, are they know. still alive? Um, yeah, yeah. And, oh, and, and this isn't good. This is brilliant, you know, and it sort of, it reminded everybody, you know, and they're by now in their, you know, they're, they're in their 70s, they're, they're remind everybody that they were alive and making and capable of making an incredible film. Um, and um, I remember, you know, they came over to London, I presented that film at the London Film Festival in, in 2012 and uh, and their their mischievousness their passion their enthusiasm for movies was completely undimmed and they were really gratified and and um gr gratified and, and and really touched that that people were responding so much to a new film that they they'd made um and that they suddenly had a new relevance again you know uh, which was great it's great that that happened you know yeah, talk about a second wind. And I mean, it's yeah. right, right at the, you know, the end of the career. It's what you always dream of is sort of people you admire getting the, uh, not only getting the credit they deserve, but producing something which is up to their powers. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and you know, and, and they made another film together, but Vittorio was already ill when they were writing the script. And, and, and you know, and I, and I, I, I like Paolo's last film, uh, Leonora Adio because it is like a kind of coda. It's him looking back on his career, looking back on Italian politics and history and Italian cinema. And it's a homage and it's a it's a pain to his brother, you know, mm. and, and it's sort of on a way rounds out the canon, you know. Um uh and and it, it's sort of beautifully he got to make that, you know. Um but um but no I think I think for both of them it was so gratifying that you know, Caesar must die. Put them back into the limelight for all the right, all the right reasons, and and um, and, and showed their cinematic, you know, imagination and uh, their sense of daring was 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 undimmed. You know, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic, and it was a sort of like it was almost you could easily mistake it for like a debut film of a really daring sort of Joshua Oppenheimer style uh, hybrid documentary almost. Yeah, no, absolutely, it was, um, and it was them in a way going back to their, you know, their Rossellini roots and and and, and looking back at Neo realism, thinking, well, what can we do? Let's do something that's completely unexpected. We've been do we've been doing period movies, doing historical stories, you know, we've been doing you know these things which they had, and they're doing them very well. We've been doing adaptations of novels. Let's let's not do any of that. Let's go into a prison. Take a copy of Julius Caesar with with us and see what they say. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you are crazy like a fox, man. Crazy like a fox. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So the season continues in March. Uh, and so people who are around London or it might be worth a trip into London to see that. Um, and uh, I'm sure there will be uh, some reissues and, and some uh some dvd some there are and, and the bfi has also put i think four or five titles on iplayer as well so excellent you can access them online for this period too so uh things like nice of the shooting stars are available on on bbc iplayer so you can come along to the season in london you know i'd say i'm introducing stuff through the rest of this month and and through next month uh and there's also stuff on on iplayer as well yeah Excellent. Thank you so much, Adrian, for taking the time to come and talk to me. And um, I really look forward to revisiting some uh, Tavani brothers myself. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the chat. Arrivederci ragazzi.
speriamo in un prossimo film. Lo speriamo.